Thank you, Louise. It's an honour to have been asked to speak in such distinguished company. The Premier of Ontario, when promoting a far-reaching amendment to that province's Bill of Rights, answered all questions about its implications with this simple formula. We don't know. The courts will decide. Such an inside flick pass doesn't come too often. Courts being told they can venture into the politically controversial world of recognition, protection of rights, and to tell us what they all mean. Hopefully no Australian Parliament would be so brave. But what does this attitude really reveal about what's going on? Let us trace the steps. First, the legislature reduces, I want to emphasise that word, reduces to writing, as we commonly say, high questions of human dignity and rights. It then hands to judges the authoritative determination of matters considered so fundamental and inherent that for generations we consider them beyond human agency to enact. That is, they were beyond the capability of words to express. My first point is this. Once we capture these notions in text, we make them specially susceptible, if not to reinterpretation, to repeal. What can be enacted in text can be removed. The second is this, and it's a theme which emerged from Chief Justice Alsop's paper. There are limits to the illuminating power of text. Courts have sometimes been considered to adopt Alexander Hamilton's phrase. He's getting a lot of airtime today, isn't he? The least dangerous branch to the political rights of the Constitution. But the act of judging as traditionally understood imports restraints, higher restraints, restraints more built in than those which can be expressed simply in written constitutions. Hamilton saw the courts as the bulwarks of a limited constitution against legislative encroachments, owing in part, he said, to the independent spirit in the judges and the fact of it being, emphasised this word, the weakest of the three departments of power. Bills of rights, like written constitutions, are intended to place matters beyond, some matters, beyond the whim of the legislature. But by doing this, we can bring about the very transference to the courts of the power we wish to deprive the legislature of. And this transference has the capacity to affect the ability of judges, the judiciary, borrowing again from Hamilton, to be the citadel of the public justice and public security. I want to explore constitutions as an expression of limits. I want to suggest we need a better appreciation of built-in limits. But let's call them, for the moment, fundamental principles. They're our protection against treating law as merely a tool for some practical purpose, some fashionable passing purpose, as distinct from serving the higher ends of justice. Real limits are not to be found in textual commands. There are limits to the extent to which text can illuminate, particularly when we deal with matters of high concern. They come and go and they can be reinterpreted. The sooner we recognise that problem, hopefully the sooner we'll stop rushing to textualise our entire universe. To maintain the landscape of limits to which our constitution gives expression and to revitalise them, we need to have a deeper understanding of limits themselves. Why do we need them? How do we maintain their efficacy? And importantly, why is it that limits often evade textual expression? Let me develop this a little. Written constitutions are the main ways we say that fundamental laws cannot be changed, as other laws. To admit that there is a law that Parliament cannot change through the usual channels with the ordinary majority requirement for any act of legislation, entrenchment, is to say that Parliament, in this country at least, is not, as many sometimes say in shorthand, sovereign. Parliament, we recognise in our country, is not capable of making any law, and nor would we have that to be the case. Current teaching in law schools is the sovereign. In contemporary Australia's majority of people and majority of states combined with Parliament, the giving of assent, so, so forth. 
The idea, though, of parliamentary sovereignty in some context is there are no laws that parliament cannot make or unmake and that no consideration of morality or natural law or higher principle can prevail against a clear statute. Judges are compelled on this theory to apply laws made by parliament and cannot condemn them on the grounds of incompatibility with fundamental principles of common law. To act otherwise, as the theory goes, at least in England, would be to usurp the legislative function. This thinking is characteristic of two habits of thought. One, legalism, and the second is positivism. Both I want to speak against. The trouble with them is that the whole idea of limits go out the window. They've got lost in the terminology of sovereignty, which at least traditionally brought some concept of restraint. Historically, we fought against a sovereign, a monarch, who asserted divine right and absolutism. We never regarded the sovereign's right to make law and to judge as unlimited. Why would we do it now? I want to explore these deeper motivations fairly briefly because I want to suggest they're the underlying cause of a lot of the problems which this conference, speakers of this conference, are identifying. They're, to put in the words of the Chief Justice, the larger structure within which practical lawmaking and judging occurs. And they affect, I want to say, not in the abstract, they're not ethereal, they very much are pre-theoretical commitments to what we do in practice. They govern our daily lives and our daily actions in what we do when we make and we judge in respect of law. Legalism is an ethical attitude which holds moral conduct to be a matter of rule following and moral relationships to consist of duties and rights determined by rules. That is, legalism is all about following the rules and not questioning whether they're good or bad and how they correlate to higher historical different concepts of justice or, in the words of the Chief Justice, to the larger structure. On this thinking, the rule is good because it's been made in accordance with legal procedures. Everything happens behind a veil of sovereignty on this analysis and behind the veil of legality. But that's exactly what they are, veils. More and more we experience the rigid enforcement of rules, the kind of mindless adherence we see because it is the rule. Unthinking bureaucratic processes, formalistic interpretations, blind adherence to dogma more and more common, and we all experience them more and more in our daily lives as citizens. We are all experiencing the frustration of dealing with totalising, crushing power. This is our experience of legalism, a kind of quarantining of the truly political, the truly personal and the truly relational into the legal realm. This legalistic thinking makes Parliament a kind of black box, that is, provided you satisfy the legal procedures about bringing an act into existence, provided the processes are formally followed, we obliterate any question of whether the rule or the volume of them is legitimate. Once an act's passed, its authoritative status ends all debate about its correlation to superior notions of justice or common good. And I wonder whether there are many of us in the room who think that everything Parliament does is really the product of full, rigorous, open, democratic <laughs> debate. But why would we correlate the two? Why would we say that anything that is done enjoys full authority and legitimacy merely because it's gone through the, uh, through the process? And that's to say nothing of executive commands, of course, which are not subject to them at all. On this view, there's no higher limit. Laws can be made. Pragmatic lawmaking and justice are the same thing. The formal presence of democracy is enough. But we live, I want to suggest, because of this, in a time of breathless hyperactivity in lawmaking. More and more rules. Harsher punishments to encourage compliance with more and more rules. Less sensible rules. Less publicly supportable rules. More criminal offences. And, of course, another agency of the executive to administer the rules and the punishments. The second influence I want to talk about is positivism. 
Positivism holds this, genuine knowledge is that which we derive from our sensory experience as interpreted through reason and logic. And so legal positivism, by extension, sees law as the commands of human beings. I've got nothing against reason and logic, but what I struggle with is this, that everything that governs our life should be the commands of human beings rather than being informed by the larger structure, by tradition, custom and spontaneous ordering. On this view, things with tangible physical form are easier to experience. We love the thing we can see and touch. There's an immediacy, an ease, a giving of priority to things we can see and feel, and better still, things we've made ourselves. We like what we've made ourselves and tend to prefer that over what experience and tradition hands down. We'd prefer to do it ourselves, thank you. So text and legislation have become more important. They're positive enactments. They're things of our own creation and they're supposedly within our own control. But where have gone these things, the organic, the spontaneous, the grown, the evolutionary, the common consciousness, where have those things which many of us experienced? The competing mediating social institutions, where have those things gone? In their place, we have legislation, codes of practice, policies, regulations, rules, and how many other types of enactments. I've mentioned these things because they're both enemies of real and built-in limits. The kind of limits we make ourselves, I want to suggest, are no limits at all. That is, the thing you impose on yourself will never be a real limit. It's human nature. They're fragile, temporary and expedient. It's why we see constantly, and I've heard many people in this room talking about it, it's why we see constantly these apparent limitations collapse when they're pushed. They don't withstand at all any pressure. What I've just described seems to me to separate conservatives and so-called progressives. I, I want to use these terms not in the standalone sense which the Chief Justice rightly said were problematic. Posit progressive outlooks for a minute, tend to be constructivist. They, in respect of politics and morality, see those things as able to be constructed and not to be received. Conservatives tend to be realists, and I mean that in the old-fashioned sense of realists, focus on things outside the mind and above and beyond us. Conservatives conceive of these things as given and beyond the exercise of independent human will. In short, conservatives recognise a source of order beyond those that are capable of textual expression. They recognise a source of knowledge and wisdom that is beyond the illuminating power of text. These deep-seated attitudes infiltrate our lawmaking and one can see why we've ended up in the position we have. So it's no wonder that text has become the new citadel but they have less effect, as I've suggested. An unwritten constitution, for a minute, let's compare the two, like the British system, does not give rise to digital review of legislation or uh, ability to determine its compatibility with constitutional norms, leave aside the sorts of example we just had. But at least there's greatly reduced occasion for the courts to reinterpret those matters. An unwritten constitution subsists in a broad scale and historically dependent way. The process of changing a constitution, which has grown organically, is an incremental one, and not within wet any one body's political authority to adjust. I'm not criticising written constitutions. In a federation, we need them, and of course, in a, in a, in a, in a new uh, country, for Europeans at least, one needs them with a, with a new constitutional settlement. But the point is this, to draw the difference, that we don't, haven't always conceived in the Western tradition of constitutional norms being as up for grabs as uh, some now suggest. The more sovereignty there is in the hands of lawmakers, I want to suggest, and include judges and parliaments in it, the more there is a need for a foil. We know this. We've divided our departments of government into three. We know that exercise of power to be restrained only understands the exercise of contrary power.
there are very great problems, I want to suggest, if we pretend to sovereignty, if we pretend that it's within our capacity to make and unmake any form of law without any respect for real limits. And the foil here is the Ontario illustration with which I open shows, is that handing over considerable power to the judiciary risks them becoming the ultimate arbiters of these matters. It involves a recognition that people cannot be assumed to have granted away unlimited and despotic power just because they've elected a parliament. There are limits that even the populated polity must recognise and respect. Former UK Supreme Court Justice Jonathan Sumption has commented on the powers that legislatures lose with written constitutions passed to judges. The determinacy of a written constitution creates, you see, these other problems. The constitutional court becomes vested with supreme power to decide what the constitution might be found to inform and even impliedly so. And just as the constitution is entrenched with a written constitution, so is the judicial ruling upon it. It makes sense. You entrench the text, you've entrenched the interpretation of the text, and of course it faces the difficulty, of course, if there is to be one of the change by referendum, which creates other problems. Three problems I want to finish with. One, we're addicted to text and we've forgotten it. We're unaware, so strong is the seduction that we've, we're unaware of it. Human temptation is too strong to see the things which we can see and touch as real and not the concept to which the text is trying to give expression. Written constitutions of their nature try to give expression to fundamental and important concepts. And at the outset, whether it be on the yacht Lucinda or in the convention debates, what the drafters are trying to do is reduce these high concepts which must be respected to text. But the text is only a substitute and only a secondary substitute for the real objective thing. The second problem is something called nominalism. Is this concept... Does something have a separate existence from what we've called it? The modern tendency is to say that nothing has an existence outside the mind. It's all really the name we give to something and the description. Once we've given it the name, once we've counted the stars, if you're familiar with the story of the Little Prince, we've captured those things because they're countable. The thing which we've quantified, we own. Richard Weaver, in his 1948 book, Ideas Have Consequences, saw this issue as, as follows whether there is a source of truth higher than and independent of man. He saw the course of humankind as being greatly affected by these basic ideas and not being mere philosophical musings, but the ideas we tacitly hold which inform our everyday actions. Nominalism breeds instrumentalism. Law becomes a means to an end. Law becomes up for grabs. And we've heard so many examples of this in speakers where people have identified the way in which law risks becoming instrumentalised, mobilised for the purpose of uh, particular passing outcomes. The third and last problem is one I see as a collapse of higher laws, I've seen in my lifetime and you've seen in yours, which we used to see as putting boundaries around the kind of laws we'd make and how rapidly we'd make them. In the days when the idea of parliamentary sovereignty caused no real alarm, lawmaking was, we need to accept this historically, a marginal activity of parliament. We've forgotten that parliaments, governments generally, were not about lawmaking. Until about the mid-1800s, parliaments were about good administration. We can take off some exceptions like the Reformation and so forth. But to a large extent, we had elected representatives to effect competent, good, careful, reflective, deliberative administration and not to um, reform, to use a, a loaded term. Law was thought in those days to exist, not to be made. Laws were marginal adjustments to the reigning state of affairs. This was a subsidiary incidental duty of Parliament. You can see how we've slid into this idea of Parliaments, in fact, as all exercise of public authority. 
without really knowing it, these ideas seem to have influenced our uh, view of it and very much authorised a more aggressive, hyperactive even form of lawmaking. These feelings, that's what they are, feelings of legalism and positivism were already there, but they seem to have emerged more clearly in recent times. It's time I think we asked ourselves this, whether we have a legal and political system that centres around a centralised and centralising will, a totalising power, and whether that makes it harder for diverse legal orders to function and organic, spontaneous social groups. That is whether, I think de Tocqueville summed it up years ago, didn't he? The huge tutelary power, he said, that enervates the populace by providing all our petty pleasures sort of concept. But that's the cost which comes with a hyperactive, totalising power, and I want to suggest it's time to reassess it. In conclusion, if our written constitution is to function as real restraint upon lawmaking, whether it be by judges or by assemblies, we need to be informed by an appreciation of what real built-in limits look like. Part of that is uncovering, I want to suggest, the submerged forces that render limits no limits at all. Legalism, positivism, nominalism, instrumentalism are the enemies of real limits. The only real limits that exist are imminent principles of right, fundamental principles, or at least a recognition, this is important, of our incompleteness, our restricted capacity for constructive and forward-looking initiative. Good constitutionalism, in my respectful view, requires us to recover a rationale of limits themselves, why we need them, and how to maintain their efficacy. Thank you. Thank you.